Hello Year 4 and this is your reading lesson for Monday the 1st of February. Um, we are carrying on with the story of Fintan Fedora, the world's worst explorer. Now last time, chapters 12, 10, 11 and 12, we were left, the Bombsteads were waiting at the airport. They hadn't really got any sort of plan. So they were just hanging around there. Um, Max Wrench managed to hang on for three days and three nights in the water, holding on to the ship where he was discovered on shore. And then he quickly phoned Randall T. Buckmeister uh, from the luxurious New York office um, to say about Fintan Fedora is actually a criminal mastermind and tried to kill him. <laughs> of all things which we know is not true it was just a, one of those very very unfortunate accidents that Fintan Fedora always manages to get into but obviously Max Wrench thinks that he tried to kill him so they have got a spy they've arranged for a spy to follow Fintan Fedora and Gribbly on their mission to find the Choco Plum so they managed to track down um, the lady at the cafe uh, Quarantina and she has decided that she's going to trust Fintan Fedora and Gribbly and tell them where they can find the Choco Plum. Meanwhile the spy was listening and Fintan moved the candle over onto the table didn't he which set fire to the man's disguise leaving us with Fintan thinking what a strange man that was. So still none the wiser that he is being followed. So he's got the Bumsteads trying to kidnap him and then he's got uh, Buckmeister and Mac Max Wrench trying to follow him for the Brazilian Choco Plum, which is looking like it might be a real thing. So let's move on to, we're gonna do chapter 13 and 14. So chapter 13. It was nearly lunchtime by the time the Bumstead staggered into Santo Colojo town centre, though according to their stomachs it was already several hours past lunchtime, possibly several days. Edith had eaten a handful of berries she'd found in a roadside bush and was now regretting it, as they were causing severe stomach cramps and uncontrollable wind. The fact that the resulting wind smelled like rotting fish ooh, meant that Eric was regretting her eating them too. With their stolen jackets draped over their heads to keep the sun off, they slouched into town and looked around for somewhere to eat. So what's your brilliant plan then? inquired Edith sarcastically. We haven't got any money, remember? Simple, said Eric. We go to the cafe, order food and eat it. Before they bring the bill, we run for it, just like we do when we eat out at home. Not having any foreign money is the same as not having any English money either. They stopped outside a classy-looking restaurant and peered in the window. This'll do nicely, pronounced Eric, and pushed the door open. Despite their shambolic appearance and unpleasant smell, a waiter politely seated them by the window and gave them both a large leather-bound menu. See, said Eric smugly, piece of cake, as usual. The menu was, of course, written in Portuguese, but luckily there were also little il illustrations, which they pointed at hungrily when the waiter returned. Having ordered two huge main courses each and three sticky desserts, they settled back to their chairs and happily awaited the free feast. Outside the restaurant window, the good people of Santos Colojo, Colojo were going about their daily business. Fat-bellied men with big moustaches accompanied by smiling women with big hats ambled around casually in the sunshine. A shaven-headed man was happily selling delicious looking hot dogs and tortillas from a rusty old green van. Next to this stood a small, busy bus station where a group of colourfully dressed people with suitcases was gathered. Most looked like locals, but there was also a handful of tourists. Eric's eyes fell on an extremely old woman in a dirty apron who was giving directions to a pair of Europeans. One was a smartly dressed man in his fifties and the other was a scruffy-haired boy who seemed to be dressed as a jungle explorer. Lurking furtively behind them was an odd-looking man in a terrible fake beard. He appeared to be fiddling, fiddling about with the boy's rucksack as if he was trying to hide something in it. Eric watched with vague interest. He could understand why someone might take things out of people's rucksacks. 
That was stealing, but putting things in, very odd. He was just musing to himself how weird this was, when he suddenly realised who the boy was. Eric's mouth fell open and he pointed in mute astonishment out of the window. I, I don't believe it, he said when he finally recovered the power of speech. Mum, look, look, it's him standing at the bus stop. At that very moment, a bus pulled up by the waiting passengers obscure in their view. Who? said Edith distractedly, far more interested in what was about to appear on her plate than anything that might be going on outside. It's the fedora boy, look, hissed Herrick, who was, a ri- who was already rising from his chair. Edith looked where he was pointing and saw nothing but a bus. Don't be so daft, Eric, she snapped. You're seeing things again, aren't you? It was definitely him and the other bloke too, the butler. I know it. Without waiting to see if his mother was going to follow him or not, Eric bolted from the table and ran out into the street, dodging the traffic. He rushed across the road and stared into the bus as each of the passengers took their seats. The scruffy-haired boy looked. Boy took a window seat right in front of him and immediately began eating the peanut butter sandwiches he'd packed for the journey. It was undoubtedly Finton Fandora. Fedora, right in front of him, the horrible, irritating little kid Eric had been trying so hard to kidnap and who had outwitted him at every turn. Edith emerged at the restaurant door and bellowed across the street at him. Eric, get back here. They're bringing the food. Eric, are you even listening to me? The bus pulled away and Eric's blood boiled. Determined not to lose his quarry again, he ran after it for a while then stopped and looked around frantically for some form of transport he could steal. With a look of insane intent on his face, he clambered into the open flap of the side of a hot dog van and began scuffling with its horrified owner. Edith hobbled towards the violently shaking van, screaming for Eric to pull himself together and come back for his lunch. But arriving just in time to see the poor innocent hot dog vendor get shoved out onto the road. Eric, what the hell do you think you're doing? she shrieked. Shut up and get in, mother, Eric barked, staring, starting the tatty old van's engine. Hedy flung open the the passenger door and awkwardly climbed in. With a nasty squealing of tyres and crunching of gears, Eric steered the van away from its protesting owner at full speed and headed after the disappearing bus. Are you completely mad, shouted Edith. They were just bringing the food, it smelled really nice. It was him, I tell you, said Eric through gritted teeth, his face red with rage and exhilaration. It was definitely him. Ignoring the hail of bottles, sausages and frying pans which were flying out of the wide open serving hatch, the bumsteads roared out of San Coho and headed south towards the forest. The chase was on again. (laughs) Oh dear. Right, chapter 14. Max Wrench was sitting in his hotel room applying a soothing cream to his burnt head. When the phone rang, he snatched it up immediately. Wrench here, any news? Yes, but not good, replied Randall T. Buckmeister from his New York office. I think you might be right. I had Gonzale, one of our best Brazilian guys, look into this Fedora kid's background. His story checks out. He's serious. Gonzales tailed him undercover to a rendezvous with an old woman at a calf. Seems the kid realised he was being followed and, uh, set fire to him. I knew it, snarled Wrench, whose worst suspicions were now confirmed. Confirmed. You see what we're up against here? Don't let his age, don't let his age fool you. He's ruthless. Certainly looks that way, agreed Randall. But it also means he's on to something big. Whoever this old woman was, she gave him some information. I've instructed Gonzales to keep watch outside the kid's hotel. When he makes a move, he'll be right after him. Listen, Wrench, wherever these fruits are, I want you to get there first. Whatever it costs, I'll put all the company's resources at your disposal. You can trust me, Randall. I'll beat this kid to the fruit trees, all right, said Wrench confidently. Then after a moment or two, thought began to reel off his shopping list. First off, we're going to need plenty of guns. Give me some armed guys on the ground. Tracking gear, satellite phones, helicopters with lifting facilities, forest clearing machinery, flamethrowers, that kind of thing. Oh, and I'll need a bunch of cash too. This could get expensive. Randall saw no problem with any of this. In the corrupt world of Giganti Foods International, helicopters and flamethrowers were a normal requirement. The cake business was a very serious affair. Consider it done, Wrench, he barked and hung up. There was a 
brief nasty silence during which Wrench realised his wife Barbara was scowling at him. Oh, I see. So it's suddenly turned into another business trip, has it, Max? She sneered with her hands planted angrily on her hips. And what about the luxury holiday you promised to take me on? What about the sightseeing and the yachts and the shopping? If you think you're going to ruin my holiday just to please that boss of yours, then you'd better think again. I'm warning you, if you're not careful, then this marriage is seriously in trouble. It's me or the cakes, Max. Make your choice. Me or the cakes. Max didn't have to think very hard about this dilemma. Have a nice holiday, Bob, he said, closing the door behind him. Right, and that was chapter 14, and I need a drink now, doing those accents. <clears throat> those accents badly. It's hurting my throat. <laughs> right, till next time then. Bye for now, year four.